Welcome. Is everyone in? Everyone have a good walk? So um, I'm Sarah Coffey and um, I'm the director of Vermont Performance Lab and I'm uh, so happy that you're all here today. Um, Vermont Performance Lab has been working in collaboration with Wyndham Regional Commission um, and a number of partners in our community including um, the Vermont River Conservancy, the Connecticut River, um, the Connecticut River Conservancy, um, Bonneyvale Environmental Education Center and three schools, um, the Hilltop Montessori School and the Marlboro Elementary School and the Guilford Central School to, on this project that's it's called the Confluence Project. So if you've seen little brochures around town, so like this. So what we've done with this project is um, I'm delighted that we've been able to bring the artists, to, uh, three artists to work in the, our three schools and to, to produce an, a series of public programs um, in what we're calling as an experiment in creative placemaking to explore our waters and our watershed. So over the last several weeks, um, we've had stream scientists and regional planners come into the classroom at Hilltop along with one of our visiting artists, Judy Dow. Judy, can I ask you to come up with me? So I want to introduce Judy Dow, who um, is an amazing force and an amazing teacher, an amazing artist. And um, it's been so great working with you. at the Governor's Institute in Vermont many years ago teaching at the Governor's Institute for the Arts. And um, a few years later, we had a um, uh, Native Alaskan choreographer here doing a salmon, doing salmon skin, making lanterns out of salmon skin. And Judy joined us um, as part of the residency. So when we had this opportunity, um, we really felt, I felt that it was really important if we're talking about watershed, uh, watershed study in our rivers, that we needed to have a Native perspective, um, um, a Native American perspective on this work as well. So it's been really so much fun. Judy King arrived, has been here, came for several visits in the spring, um, and has been working with uh, Nora Gordon. I want to say Nora, where's Nora? Right here. And Paul Dudell. Um, and um, and it's, been, it's, been, it's been an adventure. And I wanted to call, thank a couple of people before I turn things over to you guys. Um, I wanted to thank Kathy Erker um, from the Connecticut River Conservancy. Um, and Ryan O'Donnell. I don't know if Ryan is here tonight from the, no, from the Southeast the Supermarket. Okay, oh, he had a rehearsal. Okay. And, um, and Steve Lee, who most of you just met <laughs> like who, um, on, on site. And Sue Filling from the town of Brattleboro, who's um, been a really important um, Person. And we also need to thank our funders because to do projects like these, it does take some resources. So um, I want to thank the um, the Wyndham Foundation, the Fresh Sound Foundation, the Thompson Trust, the Vermont, and the Vermont Arts Council for um, supporting this work that we're doing in, in schools, these interdisciplinary arts and water science um, residencies. So um, I'm excited about what's been going on at Hilltop um, uh, this week with students, and I'm excited to hear more. So I'm going to turn over to you, Judy. Thank you thank so much. You. And I'd also like to thank um, Karen Saunders, who is, uh, let me see if I can get this right, a paleo forest. Paleo-ecologist. Paleo-ecologist. And she worked with the students this past week 
doing soil samples and plant ecology in um, studying a wet meadow. So, um, 400 years ago, children this age would have spoken three languages. They would have gre greeted you, Kwai Kwai Ni Duba, hello friends. Bonjour mes amis, hello friends. And in English, hello friends. So it was a con uh, economic traveling and all kinds of things going on here. So they would have spoken primarily three different languages. So it's kind of been like that this week. Um, <laughs> we had this enormous science language to learn about. And so I want to just explain a couple of words that they'll be using. So um, our, our word for a river that runs on an east and west direction between two high points on a channel is called a pasana. A river like the Connecticut that runs north and south between two high points is called the Wahana. And um, the English came over with the word interval. And when you get out of New England, nobody knows what interval means. So, but it's the same thing. It's a long, narrow valley between two high points on a river. And so they're going to tell you um, about everything they've learned the last month or month and a half or so. And it's going to include <coughs> all different kinds of sciences. And the component that Nora and I were interested in December when we first came together to plan this was a social justice component. And um, that social justice in component included me coming here last week to work with the Youth for Change group that meets right here in the Root Center. And we got, we heard, I heard their voices and their thoughts about what they would like to see happen on that land. And I shared those voices with the students and they have incorporated their voices as well as their opinion into their projects. And so I have asked them to become the teller of the story the teller of all of this knowledge that they've acquired over the last month and a half and give it as a gift to you to educate you folks as to everything they've learned. Thank you. So um, as many of you guys saw, I made a scrapbook. So I'm going to, um, it kind of outlines our journey. So I'm going to read it to give you a starter. Steve Libby visited our class to talk about plans for Sawdust Alley. It was pretty cold. <laughs> we explored the barren landscape of Sawdust Alley, writing down our observations. Ryan O'Donnell and Kathy Erper visited our class. They taught us about infiltration, what makes a river impaired, and the Connecticut River watershed. We got a stream table. It was cool to do experiments on, but it made quite a mess. <laughs> we learned the different parts of our river. We did a lot of experiments, like this one. What happens when you put riprap on a river before and after? We searched the Whetstone River for macroinvertebrates with Billy Ernest. We shook them from the river bank and caught them with a net. We sorted them into ice trays and counted them. We got quite a, a scare from this plastic snake we found in the river. <laughs> <laughs> Judy Dow visited our class to start brainstorming for our art pieces. We visited the Putney Central School Forest and took soil samples with Karen Saunders. We took a walk through the woods and meadows. Karen Saunders taught us what plants grow in a healthy marsh. Using images from Putney Forest, we imagined what the sawdust alley site might look like after restoration. How can we restore the whetstone? We, we identified some ways it's impaired, such as riprap and pollution. 
It was a lot of studying, but we had fun. With all of our knowledge about rivers, we set out to express what we learned in the Confluence Project. Through this project, we set out to make recommendations for the Sawdust Alley site. Okay, so I studied terraces that are surrounding Sawdust Alley. So I call this the bathtub effect. Um, the bathtub is important to think about when you're talking about Sawdust Alley. Um, when you put something in a bathtub, for instance, the water rises, which in this case increases flooding. Sawdust Alley is filled up with gravel. The river has nowhere to go but up. As a result of this, retaining walls and berms have been built, making the bathtub effect more dangerous. I showed this in my wood carving. So I wanted to show the drastic, drastic changes um, from the river to the highest wall or terrace. And this is Sawdust Alley, which is a slightly different color and a little bit more filled because it's filled up with soap. Um, and I'm gonna put, when I put this back, feel free to touch it. Um, you can feel the difference with your hands. I also studied terraces, but I went out with a GPS and went hiked around out here on each up each side of the two hills that we're kind of right in the middle of right now and I went up to each terrace and took a elevation reading with the GPS and came back and brought that onto a piece of paper which is back there um so I wrote those GPS those elevations in the places that I took them on my drawing and then I transferred that drawing with pencil onto this basket that I made with using the twining technique out of reeds. And then I painted it with Sharpie and then filled it all in with um, acrylic paint. Then I used the label maker and made these different elevation labels to tell you how much of a difference there is between the, the places on this basket. <laughs> Um, so my name is Emmy, and I looked at the difference between a floodway and a flood plain. Um, a flood plain is the area that gets flooded in a storm. On many, on my two maps here, um, the light blue is called a 500-year flood plain, although that title is not completely accurate due to climate change. A 500-year flood plain. Um, would be flooded once around every 500 years. Currently, Sawdust Alley is a 500-year floodplain, but when the fill is removed, that will change. Um, a floodway is the area that gets filled with water in a flood, but becomes an extension of the river instead of settling out. Sediment and debris are dropped on, the, on, a, flood, on a floodplain in the event of a flood. The same is not true for a floodway. When the fill is taken out, Sawdust Alley will become part 500-year floodplain, part 100-year floodplain, and the floodway will be expanded. So our classmate Julian could not be here today, but he, he looked at the meandering of the whetstone and he made this. So here are some of his words about his art. Um, if a river's channel is straightened, it will start to carve away at its banks. This will create a cut bank, the bank of the river being eroded and a point bar, the bank of the river where eroded material is deposited. Erosion is a natural part of a river's life as long as the levels of erosion are not too high. When a river has meanders, it is able to slow down and there will not be as much erosion. 
This is because when the water goes around the meanders, it is not going as fast, so there is less force. When a river meanders, the slope of the river decreases. The height of the land stays the same, but the distance the river travels gets longer. Eventually, a river can reach dynamic equilibrium. This is when the amount of erosion and de deposition are in balance, and the river is in a healthy condition as a result. The meanders in the river may continue eroding, moving up the river, but not up. The, west, the whetstone is in an area where it can't move much because of two high points on either side. By opening up Sawdust Alley and taking the riprap off the upstream bank, the river, the river will have more room to move and change to slow itself down. Making Sawdust Alley part of the floodway could help the whetstone reach dynamic equilibrium. Mm -hmm. um, our group studied the natural part of the river. Me personally, I studied, um, I looked at riparian zones and then like kind of human development next to rivers. A riparian zone is a area that has plants, trees, and layers of natural material in the soil. So it's pretty much a forest but next to a river. Um, why riparian zones are good is because it absorbs a lot of water during a rain and it also shades the water. It keeps the water temperature down. And then why human development like roads, uh, lo like lawns and parking lots are bad is because it doesn't uh, absorb any water when it rains and also any water that falls on a road or a parking lot that goes in the river increases the temperature and why it's bad to increase the temperature in a river is because a lot of our native fish like cooler temperatures in the river and yeah. I'm Lily, but I'm going to be first sharing a project of a student who is not able to be here. So this is Anna's project. So um, there are three baskets, and each basket has a different plant painted on it. One being sedges, and another being rushes. Thank you. <laughs> and the last being um, red osier dogwood. So all of these plants contribute to a healthy wetland, and rushes and sedges are very similar in what they do. They both absorb pollutants in the water, and they both slow water down in a flood event. Red osier dogwood helps riverbeds stay together in flood events as well. All of these plants should be grown in Sawdust Alley to create a healthy environment. Yay. So for my project, I created a cookbook because in my opinion, the best way to really get people excited about a project is through their stomach. <laughs> so I knew I had to incorporate food somehow into this project. So. As you saw from our walk, the land really just sort of looks like a field right now, and I don't know how many of you guys really walked around it, but currently there's a lot, a lot of poison ivy, and that's about the, that and I would say knotweed are probably the only plants that are really, really thriving. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, a lot of the plants there, you have to be careful about eating them. But I hope that in the future, we can bring back native Vermont plants and enjoy them, one, as food for animals, and two, as food for us. So I studied elder, um, elderberry, which would be something we introduced. I studied um, river <coughs> grapes or wild grapes. I studied marsh marigold and then two other plants that I studied that are already there, but I wouldn't recommend eating them from this property at this moment, would be knotweed and um, cattails. So I hope that this book can act as a guide for foraging in Sawdust Alley if you want to in future years after excavating, and for even foraging in your own backyard, because you'd be surprised by how many plants you can find in there. <laughs> the way 
way we think about invasive plants, or so-called invasive plants, like Japanese knotweed. Um, a lot of people think that knotweed should be destroyed. And they have several reasons for this. It's out-competing native species. It can force its way through roads and foundations and destroy them. Um, and it's native, so it just doesn't belong. Uh, on top of all that, it's hard to destroy. Um, I really enjoy destroying knotweed, actually. <laughs> um, but it is important to remember that knotweed is useful. There's recipes for it. Uh, you can make paper out of it, as I did with my project. Uh, bees can make honey out of it. Eating it can prevent cognitive diseases like Alzheimer's and decrease risk of heart disease and potentially prevent cancer. The list goes on. Um, so I made paper out of knotweed, dandelions, and a little bit of lilacs to <coughs> consider and I used it to bind a story uh, about knotweed to show how we consider knotweed invasive and bad, but we consider dandelions and lilacs pretty, usually, uh, even though all of them are not native to America. Uh, I'm not saying that knotweed is without flaws or shouldn't be destroyed. I'm just saying we should examine how we think about it. <laughs> macroinvertebrates. Macroinvertebrates are insects and larva form. Um, sampling for the presence of macroinvertebrates is a great way to check the level of pollution in a body of water. Using the amount of microinvertebrate diversity, you can decide if further testing is needed. Um, our class took a rough pool of microinvertebrates in the water near Sawdust Alley, and we found that the water isn't very polluted. We found many mayfly larvae, and Mayflies are some of the most pollution intolerant species and cannot live in very polluted water. So keeping a healthy river means people and animals can use it safely, which is really important. Mm uses or of um, what is supposed to be the uses for the land. It's very possible that um, the Abenki people who lived on the high peaks surrounding this interval got all sorts, sorts of resources from it, like plant fibers for net making and river clay for pottery. So the land also um, Science shows that it would have been a good common pot for food of all sorts of living species. Um, and eventually, in the later um, 20th century, there were many sawmills constructed here, giving the land the name Stardust Alley. So, and I made this um, blue backing to symbolize the river and how it's connecting all of these um, people and it gives these resources to us um, that represents natural harmony. So I did more of a modern look at Sada Sally in terms of its history. So I went back to the mid or early to mid 1800s about a century, early to mid 19th century to early to mid uh, 20th century. And my, I did a collage of pictures. What I did is I took some pictures from maps and um, such from books that we found uh, with pictures from that time. And I took a bunch of pictures from areas that were uh, very active at that time um, throughout the general area of Sawdust Alley. So there's a lot from the Woolen Mill, which was that big yellow building that we walked by on our way down to Sawdust Alley and on the way back. And uh, I have just a quick timeline of it. 
Um, so in 1833, the Stearns and Rue Company bought Sawdust Alley, and that's the first like um, mill company that we could track down. And then in 1840, uh, well, they established the Wool Mill Company in 1835, and then in 1847, Jordan Marshall Boston opened um, the official uh, like wool, although the building, the Woolen Company, although the building was there, it was operated by a bunch of guys. And then in 1865. It was uh, Whitmore and Davis of Springfield bought it, um, and they owned it for about a year until the Jordan and Marsh Company bought it. Um, and then by in 1855, William Fletcher uh, started operating a lumber mill at Sawdust Alley, but not on that woolen mill, which is still there. By 1900, that yellow building was turned into uh, apartment buildings. Um, and then Holden and, or, uh, yeah, um, Holden and Martin Lumber Company rebuilt uh, the Woolen Dam for their, the Woolen Company's dam for their mill. So there were a bunch of mills that ran through there. Um, and then, see, um, Lyman Holden um, and J. L. Martin established a woodworking shop on Frost Street around that area in 1904, and they used the wool uh, the wheel and the um, dam from the woolen mill. So I studied primarily that woolen mill, but also just the general area around it. So my art piece um, not only shows the river, but also the surrounding community. Um, shortly after the recommended uh, site plan is completed, and I wanted us to think about um, the voices of the immediate community around the river as we're thinking of what to do with um, the Sawdust Alley land. Um, so there are several quotes along the river here that are quotes of um, children that were working with Judy Dow here at the Root Center. Um, and I can read you some of them. Um, one of them says, uh, wildflowers and meadows with the walking trail. Um, clean water for the homeless community, listening to the heart of the people that are living here. Was be or will be um, renovated. The first step will be to remove the fill, and in this case, it'll in some places it'll be over six feet of it. It's polluted because of the lumber yard that was there um, just a few years ago. Um, even though the people and animals nearby will not be directly uh, involved they will be affected because of the construction vehicles and other parts of the construction process. Um, when the land is worked on, um, the, the houses could start to be worth more because of the beautiful land at Sox Valley and it'll be more of a scenic area. This might be a concern for many of the people living nearby. And um, some other concerns might be or not concerns, good, beneficial. Things about the construction of this site are um, the red osier, as it says in this like little speech bubble thing, um, and other beneficial plants that will be established on the site are good habitats and food sources for animals and even people. Um, the Whetstone Brook will be maintained, and so it'll be a good habitat and a water source for animals, as well as a place to swim for people. Um, the wet, uh, my piece is a representation of the wildlife and people in the Brattleboro community all participating in the reconditioning of the Sada Valley site. <laughs> Um, 
I'm Owen. Um, so when we think about floods, our minds immediately start to focus on the negative impacts that it can have on our town and community. Um, and even though floods can cause a lot of damage, they can do good for the wildlife and vegetation afterwards. At the Putney Central School Forest, where this painting is inspired by, it flooded just a few weeks ago, and you can clearly see the traces of it. For example, the grass is green and the trees are flourishing. And in the grass, there is driftwood and dead grass caught on the trunks of the trees. Um, the dead grass can also be very helpful to birds making nests. There's also red osier and willow trees on the Putney Central School Forest site. Uh, willow bark makes good tea and is good for soothing pain and helping cure sickness. Both of these bushes are very helpful to hold soil in place. And this is what Sawdust Alley could look like if we removed the floor. <laughs> so over the course of this study, we've made many discoveries and we've also had uh, we've answered some questions, and we've developed new questions, and we'd like to share all of that with you. Okay, so we believe as an invested community, it's vital that everyone gets an opportunity to speak their mind and be part of this decision process. So one big discovery that we found was that building a structure on the land could increase the water level during flooding, making continued flooding a danger to nearby communities, and we've decided that leaving the land natural would benefit more. Um, we also discovered that we need to be aware of other living things on this land when planning the changes in the use of the interval. For example, um, decontaminating the soil and allowing it to flood again will make the space healthy and inviting to plants and animals such as birds, such as rushes and red uh, In addition, the community needs to be educated about the importance of these plants in order to allow the intervale to be sustainable and used for its intended purpose of receiving excess water. By receiving excess water, the downstream communities will be better protected from flooding. And we discovered a lot of macro invertebrates in the Whetstone River at this site. Um, meaning we discovered a lot of them, meaning that the river is healthy enough to sustain this simple life form. Um, however, the whetstone is often filled with high level of E. coli, um, and it gets in the river through runoff. Um, like in the cow fields, um, there might be manure filled with E. coli, and in runoff that will get in the river. Um, so E. coli makes the water unsafe to swim in when there are high levels of it. Uh, there was also a small contaminated stream caused from road runoff that's going down the hill towards the back of Sawdust Alley. Uh, the current plan is to divert that through the existing wetland. Uh, and we think that this would be a temporary fix. Um, a better idea would be to uh, just fix the, make it not a contaminated stream and try to get to the of the problem. Um, some people see newly discovered plants on this land, such as Japanese knotweed and multiflora rose, as invasive, but others see them as introduced. So when a new species comes to Vermont, people are fearful the plant will take over, killing off certain types that have grown here. But sometimes we just have to give the plants time to find balance, because they can be useful. Uh, there are also plenty of there's also plenty of food for fish in the whetstone, uh, but the lack of a good riparian zone in some places causes the water to get too hot for fish. Mm -hmm. Also, the falls at the mouth of the river is an obstacle for fish, so they can't make it up the river, and um, it's a danger to fish population. So here's a few questions that we developed, um, and we believe these should be answered and thoroughly um, thought about before construction begins. So, who are we trying to satisfy by changing the land? Are we just thinking of humans? Uh, what about the humans who are living there? Do we need to think about them? And is there a fix for this polluted strain? Should we plant plants like sedges, rushes, and red over dogwood? And what are we going to do with the artifacts? 
that we excavate. Should we have youth on the planning board and conservation board? Do we want a place where people can go to grow? And also, do we want to build um, public use things like picnic tables or an observation platform? So think about that. <laughs> started doing this project, um, you all are here because you, you live in this community too. So the, the idea with this evening th was to bring everybody together. And I wanted to bring some resource people, invite people up to the, to the room too. Because um, we wanted to, I think the intention, right, is to open it up to a conversation. Um, and um, so Sue Fillion is here um, from the town of Broward, who's been a really amazing partner um, on, on all of this. And I think we're just going to do this kind of, Sue, how would you like to do this? Um, I think we're just thinking of opening it up and if you have stories to share about the site because you live in the neighborhood or you have some sort of connection to it, um, you've seen it change over the years or I guess if you want to respond to the students' to the work. Students, yeah. and, and and Steve, 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 I didn't see you over there. Why don't you come up too, because Steve Levy is here. So, I mean, this is an opportunity for questions, for people to ask questions or to offer their thoughts and, you know, respond to some of the work that the students have made. So, I can help. I might, I think I'm turn over to you, Sue, okay. and um, to call on people. And, like, if you have questions for Steve and, and Sue as well, this is a great opportunity. And, I just want to also thank you for turning out in such a, a, this, is, this is an amazing turnout. Um, and, um, and thank you, Judy and Nora and Finn and Paul and all of you guys for, for, for the work that you've done um, and sharing what you've learned with all of us. So thank you so much. So yeah, I think we can open it up. Also, it, to, the, to them, it was explained to create a mnemonic device to help retell the story. So we've been calling them maps, we've been calling them projects, we've been calling everything. But it was something to help them retell a part of the story. After learning that Sosasimo either is or will not be owning it soon? They don't own it anymore. Okay. Vermont River Conservancy is the owner. I see. So the tax contribution to the town that they were making is no longer being made, I would think? We're paying property taxes this year, okay. it, but we, we are going to petition the town during our ownership, which may be one to two years that the uh, property taxes would be um, forgiven for that time. Right. And then the town will own it. And then the town will own it. So I guess the, so the related question to that is one of the sort of concepts that the students were uh, alluded to was basically gentrification, the potential for gentrification in the area due potentially, you know, to all sorts of factors. Is that sort of seen by the town as a possible balance to the tax changes, or, or is that not being <clears throat> don't think that's one of the considerations um, for tax relief. I think it's because you're a nonprofit charitable. Um, I think No, I just mean from the general property taxes in the area, the value's going up. <clears throat> no, I don't I don't think that's been part of the discussion. I mean the taxes I think on the site are Forty-five hundred a year. I think. Oh, okay. yeah. I think the idea, at yeah, least, well, mm -hmm. that they're not that much that we can. You know, it's, it's not like I we're see. giving oh, up I, a I, large I amount of taxes. Yeah. Fairly significant. Okay. Yes. Uh, two things. One, I want, wanted to compliment the kids on the mnemonics and how appropriate they were for their different presentations. They were unique and all the perspectives were very unique. Um, the second is the area across from the transportation center more towards this way which was heavily damaged with the flooding. How might this effort affect that area? So <clears throat> the um, we hired an engineering firm to do a hydraulic modeling you know to like predict what might happen or what the what the downstream impacts of recreating this floodplain will be uh, we don't have the results from that yet we've been kind of bugging them for a while about that. but there there'll clearly be some 
beneficial effect. What the magnitude of that is, it's a little hard to tell. And, you know, it's a complex system. It's you can you know you can try and model these systems, but there's a lot of uh, variables that um, are not perfectly predictable. So it's it's you know not probably um, appropriate, I guess, to say we know it'll do exactly this or have exactly this impact. But you know, I think the fact that during a flood, more water will be stored on this site than not. And so that's a certain amount of water that won't be going downstream um, during a flood event. So there'll be some beneficial impact. We may be able to sharpen up that a bit once the modeling is finished, but um, it'd be fun to, it'd be you know, interesting to see how that works. And the natural course of the river would potentially slow any flood event I mean that that it would it would have a wider yeah if it, although it's still think, emptying into it yeah like yeah. think about you know taking a hose and shooting a hose into a a pool you know a little pool that the, when the water hits that pool it slows down and it dissipates and you know that's probably a bad analogy but it's kind of like that you know mm -hmm. that you're taking high velocity water that's coming from upstream and allowing it to dissipate energy in this calmer, kind of hydraulically calmer environment. And it can drop out bigger boulders. It gives it a place to kind of settle out before it gets downtown too. So that can be a benefit for downtown. Well, and just because uh, they've been getting different perspectives all week. <laughs> so just to throw out one more perspective. So what's going to happen to that land is hopefully the water that is a living entity will live and do its own thing and go back to the way it was before settlers changed it. Yes, um, I'm curious about the jobs created from this. Um, you said about two years of a project, 18 months to two years of a project. I'm just curious, um, how many jobs? Are they local? So, <clears throat> the, um, up to this point, there has been work created by this, engineering studies. Um, I don't know how much of that was local. The engineering firm was out of Waterbury. But um, during the restoration process, there, the plan right now is to solicit proposals from contractors to remove the material. So, local contractors would be likely Proposers and that would be local, local jobs for that. Um, long term, I think there's going to be some level of periodic maintenance on the property that will, you know, need to be done. So there could be some minor long term, but it's you know it's there's no construction going on. There's no not like you would think about with a kind of a construction project where you would have lots of local labor and all that sort of thing. So. Again, sorry. <laughs> um, the students put together um, possible suggestions, and the, the one of was mentioned that they would like to be on the con conservation I and the planning committee. Mm -hmm. and, we have uh, openings on both committees. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but included in their list were things like um, green up events or mm -hmm. after flooding events where maybe the driftwood could become firewood for the needy. Mm -hmm. or, um, so they had a whole list of um, possible things that could go with maintaining it in the future. Yeah. And how can we get the, the, can you guys give those lists? I mean, mm -hmm. they are they? Yeah, we yeah, printed yeah. off a copy for Steve, so okay. we'll okay. yeah. pick it up on that a bit. I'm just wondering if you could talk about when the town does take ownership, what is the decision-making process? What does it look like? How is it being envisioned right now as to what to do with the land, what uses to put it to and what not to? And how is that, like, is it going to be unique or is it going to be the same way we make the town makes those decisions for all of its properties? So the conversations that have been had um, focus on floodplain restoration, passive recreation and um, education purposes for it. Um, ultimately, it would be the select board that decides whether or not they want to accept the property or purchase, I think it's more of accept. 
Mm, yeah. Except, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Except the property. <coughs> Vermont River Conservancy, yeah. yeah, for something like yeah. the token dollar. Yeah. Um, so I think as the project moves along, there's steps along the way. So because there will be a river corridor easement on it, um, we do need to have an operations. There needs to be a, a management plan for the management. project. So yeah. part of the lot permanent protection of that property is through a legal device called a conservation easement. And that easement will have embedded as part of a management plan. And that management plan has a lot of flexibility as long as it doesn't go against the fundamental purposes of the easement, which is to you know create create the floodplain system. So there's there's latitude for all sorts of creative, like we've heard tonight, lots of creative ideas. Um, but it's um, from our point of view, it's ultimately a town via the select board or whatever process is decided. Um, that's how it should come about. Yeah, and I think coming to some agreement on what the management plan would be would be part of the public discussion. I mean, you asked about jobs, so I said at the site before the Conservation Commission has kicked around the idea of having some sort of wetland nursery. Mm -hmm. That could be a partnership with the, um, with the school, um, the regional center, or it could be maybe a private operator on, operating on the site, as mm -hmm. long as it wasn't structural. So there could be job opportunities. Um, and there. I can tell you, after spending a week last week with the Root Center um, kit youth group, and this week with this youth group, if they're on the board, they'll be unique. <laughs> um, I think did, you had a question. Um, just wondering, like, once you start like removing fill, how when do you expect to be done? And then, um, how how much are we talking about, like, in truckloads? Do you have an estimate, like, how many truckloads? So it'll probably happen in two phases. The first phase will be removing the contaminated soils. And we know right now there's about 10,000 cubic yards of contaminated soils that need to be dealt with. And there's a couple different approaches to that. But um, ultimately, 10,000 yards will be taken off site in phase one. And that's funded by an uh, EPA grant that, that we just received. The second phase will be removal of about 40,000 additional yards of material from the rest of the site to really recreate the, you know, the functional floodplain. Um, that work is probably gonna take place um, in a year from now, at the, at the earliest, 2019. So we're kind of ballparking this <clears throat> project is most optimistically starting in the fall of 2018, but most of the work will probably happen in 2019. Mm -hmm. But we're, we are incentivized to, for a lot of reasons, have it happen quickly. You know that it won't be a long. You know we'll try and have it um, the sort of construction or deconstruction process happen as quickly as we can. So, in, what does that translate into truck loads? How many trucks? Do you have? Yeah, yeah, I, that I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a lot. It's a lot. How many? There was a ten yards in the big truck. Fifteen. Yeah, ten to fifteen. Yeah. And that phase of Well, you know, it's it's hard to say, you know, depending on how whoever ends up being the contract for that may have uh, it'll be it'll be, you know, discussed during this let's get a zoning permit so there'll be opportunity to, you know, discuss how how it's gonna work. But um, yeah, it's 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 a, you know, a lot of fill's been brought in there, and to make it work again, a lot has to leave, so. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, so if there's so many trucks coming into the Sawdust Alley, how isn't the, like, the exhaust from the trucks, the, the whole thing that started the soil not being good? Yeah. What? That's a great question. Electric trucks. We'll wait for Elon Musk to get his electric trucks. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's I, no, it's. I mean, that's that's. Some of the variables are really difficult to, yeah. you know, ameliorate. And and I think that's one of them. 
I feel like since I've been in town, maybe somebody in the area can correct me if I'm wrong, there used to be a bridge over the Whetstone that connected to William Street, which is maybe how Sir Sosimo got it in, because coming down Bird Street, it's it's tight there. Mm -hmm. it's a big trucks mm -hmm. through. No, I, mm -hmm. I, I yeah. think there was some yeah. bridge. Yeah. But all those trucks came. Oh, oh. You're right here <laughs> was a bridge. The historic right here. Awesome. There, there was a footbridge for the um, oh, foot timber mill people. I don't oh. know. It, might, it looks big. They have the base from it. Yeah, still. The okay. still there. it yeah, maybe big. that's what I was imagining abutments and some metal <laughs> decking. <laughs> for, for local residents, it would be an unpleasant thing for you next year. I mean, if you're adjacent to that yeah. property, it would be a rather unpleasant thing. There will definitely be impact. Yes. Yes, with a, with a silver lining. Mm -hmm. Focus on that. Focus on the silver lining. Yeah. We only do it at night so it doesn't disrupt the crab net, right? Do <laughs> <laughs> you want the back of beepers in there? Yeah, yeah. Back of beeps. And, uh... <laughs> Will there be work on the opposite bank where you're, you know, you're going to take out that riffraff, the big piece down there? We live on the opposite bank. Will there be any work on the trees on that bank? Just on your side. Okay. Do you live on the, um, so on the upstream end across the river where there's like chairs in the woods? Yes. So some of these folks were hypothesizing that you might gain property. Because if the river moves sideways. Oh. And when I took well, the root center. Well, there's truth in that. Yeah. Because yeah. there was yeah. a very large storm in the 50s that actually created a part of our yard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And when I took the root um, center kids out there, um, once they heard the story, they were yelling to the people across the street, talking about beachfront property to them. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding the trucks, um, I don't know how big the trucks are, but it's some reason it says in my mind when it falls. 30 yards per truck, and if we're talking about 70,000 tons of yards, 50,000. 50,000, I thought it was 30 and 40. <coughs> well, Ten. anyway, even less than. That's uh, 2,000 <coughs> truck loads. Sounds like a lot, but uh, every day on Main Street, the, mm -hmm. the lumber trucks come down. They're not there over than 30 yards carrying those trees, and there's at least two dozen a day, um, it would be inconvenient, but short-lived. And you got to keep in mind this. Emblazon <laughs> <laughs> that, that in your minds. <laughs> Do we have any questions for the students in their work? Or any? Yeah. I want to know about the cookbook. Yeah, it's awesome. Recipes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. 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 Um, I have not yet tried some of the recipes. I did. Um, I've done stuff with these ingredients in the past with a friend of mine who recommended these recipes. So I'm pretty sure they probably will turn out well. <laughs> 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 um, but I have worked with some of these ingredients in the past, like cattails and elderberry. It would be fun to get a copy of the cookbook. Yeah. We, we actually have Vermont elderberry donated 10 elderberry plants to the edible rattle bar. So we have a little nursery down by the co-op, and we'll be happy to supply some elderberry plants. That would be awesome. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have any stories about the site? Do they use it recreationally? See any? Do any bird watching? Sure. Yeah, uh, Molly and I have uh, water sampled the Whetstone right upstream from that for about 30 years, all on and off. And we can tell you the water quality is very good there, right by the William Street Bridge and West Street. And we have a little swimming hole there that 
neighbors have used for years and years. So, and trout have been caught there, and and it's it's a great resource for our neighborhood, which is called Sweetville, and we've uh, enjoyed it for many years, and look forward to this project <coughs> coming up. Um, it, when we went to Putney, um, we asked the students to be very still and very quiet for a while. And I don't know, what would you say we heard 15 birds maybe? Yeah. 20 oh, birds? Yes. And then we did the same exercise at the site. We heard one. Wow. So imagine yeah. having 15, 20 bird sounds. And, and watching all these different birds there. It's like something great to mm -hmm. hold on to when those trucks rumble by. <laughs> <laughs> Some other comparisons, like when we walk in Putney, at Putney Forest, we have, we heard a lot of kind of squish, a lot of like, not mm -hmm. huge squish, like not our shoes weren't getting wet, but like squish. And then when we walked on Sada's Dally, it was crunch. Yeah. And the dust flying. Yeah. At this site, um, I think it was Emily said something about um, people um, viewing the change negatively, and I, you know, I think about how we, um, like, this is a fantastic group, and it feels like people are engaged and involved in the conversation, um, and yet there are so many people out there who are not in this room, um, and while this is a fantastic um, process and sample. It's, it's, it, does, it, it still leaves the question, how does all of this feeling, um, all this information, all of this expectation um, and understanding transmit throughout the life of the project to people who are impacted by it, people who walk by it, uh, people who hear about it and have thoughts um, that may or may not be informed. Um, and you know, I think about things like what kind of signage or story, story walking signage could be placed there um, that could, could bring people into this conversation, uh, you know, by happenstance. Um, how, how does this become a community resource that, uh, because this is beautiful work, um, I, you know, this, to see this um, happen here and um, finish here feels sad. To, have to, but to see it grow into something like really proper signage for the area so anybody who walks down there knows, oh, soon this will change. And the, the, to see the picture um, on a sign to say, this is the future of the site. And say, oh, this is what I have to look forward to. Um, to have questions posed as we walk by. Um, like, you know, um, <laughs> for example, um, who was involved in making these decisions? Um, and, and I don't mean like the whole scientific background of it. I just mean enough story to hold people in community with whatever's happening there as individuals as they encounter it whether they're hearing noise or seeing trucks or, yeah. Can I address that one? Yeah. Um, that was important to me, too. Mm -hmm. um, I run into um, where you're talking about opposition in a lot of places I go to because I look at things differently than many people. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's why, from the very beginning, we've had this discussion about hearing the voices from here. And one student mapped out those thoughts and voices from here. And um, it's, for me, when I travel about and do what, teach what I teach, um, I tell everybody that you have been given the gift of knowledge. Use it. Use your voice. Tell this story. I don't know what's going to happen to this, but this video. But even that right. becomes a resource to help tell the story. If the, if the link to the video were available on a sign, on site, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. then it's a resource, right? Well, like this, is, a, this is beautiful list. and it's a resource, but how do we make the connections happen that continue right. to pull people together in the future and well, over the life of the project? that's one of your suggestions yeah. was signage. Yeah. Um, welcoming, cool. um, cool. all, they had a whole list of, anybody have the list? Uh, Siri, do you have the list or? I have it. Yeah. I think signs are on here. Signs are very yeah. near the end. Because they did have that same thought, and they actually created a list for yeah. Steve that 
that would show what they thought would be good on site. Yeah, I've lived in the neighborhood for 18 years recently, just because of the road, but, um, I, you know, I can see all the, there, there, are, there are many faces that come to mind who, um, yeah, would really want to be informed by this project. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. As would I. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe you can just, this, we see this, we did see this as fitting within a larger process, for yeah. sure, that the, the, the work that the town and the River Conservancy are doing. And I, I have to say, it's unusual for, it's, it's unusual for a town to let a youth, a group of an artists and youth to come into the process. So I think it's really, it shows a lot of creativity and openness. So we're hoping we're, that this is part of a process. And I, we, for many of those reasons, we were talking about like how can I mean Steve was the one who said maybe you know this this can help with signage for the site. It was it was at the one of the initial conversations that yeah. we had. So I think too you could talk a little bit more about like where we're going from here. And the main I know people have to wrap up and go. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, well, I know at the conservation commission level they've kind of taken this on as a project and um, working with Steve. You know we've talked about the need for more public outreach. Um, and to keep it going throughout the process because there's going to be different aspects to it. Um, I didn't put out a sign-in sheet. I probably should have and collected emails. I mean, that's a great way that we usually start with communication. Um, and just, it, it's often hard. To, I mean, this turnout is amazing. It's, it's really great. It had, you know, everybody was kind of pushing it out on social media. Um, we did direct mailing too, but I, Steve and I earlier this week were talking about signage for the site, so it will be great to see the recommendations because um, we need to yeah. we need to build keep this is a major project for the town. And not only signage for like showing like which plant is which, but also signage for like this is where you can put your trash. This is how the, this is a parking lot. This is so we so public can understand how to maintain this beautiful site. It could also be a wonderful opportunity for Friday to chronicle the progress of the development of the site and I, I challenge any of you students to create that for us. <laughs> there is um, something I've been thinking about for the site. There's this picture post so you kind of put it in the ground and it's like an octagon and you can put your, um, your phone up to it I guess and take pictures at, at different times of the year and then they get uploaded to a website so people can see the change over time. Which I think is, is great if you think about this being restored to a flat Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that could be neat. I think that's a great note to end on. Thank you.